By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I have a super cool match for you because these two decks, I think they're just awesome. If I say so myself, I'm very humble here because I'm going to show you a brand new brew of mine that's called Tonus's Toy Store. And I'm just really excited to show it to you. It's a fully artifact deck. And yes, that means it's vulnerable, but when it goes off, it goes off. And I'm taking on Anna and Anna is just a lover of old school magic. He's been on this channel plenty of times and he's brought a really original deck to the channel. I've called it Caracas's Legends. It's pretty cool. It's built around Caracas and Legends. I mean, what's not to love? It's a five color deck. It's just epic. Now, before I start with the deck decks of both of these decks, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to go to the games first. I know some people prefer to do that. The easiest way to do that is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps and the timestamp that reads MTG Games. If you click on there, it'll take you straight to the game action. Okay, now that you are fully informed, I'm going to start with the deck decks and I'm actually gonna start with my deck, Tonus's Toy Store. Let's have a look. And here we see my deck, Tonus's Toy Store. Now, maybe you're wondering who is Tonus? Well, Tonus is the apprentice of Urza. So he was like his right hand man. He was a really talented artificer and used to have a toy store before he became an artificer. So hence the name uh, Tonus's Toy Store. And when you read the flavor text on Triskelion, you can read that people believe that he is the one that created the trike. So I thought if you created the trike, you probably also created the Tetravus. So Tetravus is also in this deck. And of course, there are also cards in the game of magic that are named after Tonus, like the Candelabra of Tonus and Tonus's Coffin. So those cards are in here as well. Now, when we look at this deck, this is really a full on artifact deck, right? So what I hope to do, I hope to get to Tronlands together. So the tower, the mine and the power plant so that they tap for a lot of mana and I can start casting my really bigger artifacts. And of course, I'm combining this with the Candelabra of Tanis. So Candelabra of Tanis is a really nifty artifact. It's one to cast, pay X, untap X target lands. So what I can do here is if I have all the Tron lands, I can tap my three Tron lands for seven mana, put three of those mana into my Candelabra of Tanis, untap my lands again, and so I can tap my Tron lands again, and I can have a bonus of four mana. So all of a sudden I get 11 mana out of three Tron lands. Can you still follow me? Well, you know, I'm going to show you hopefully in the game anyway, that will kind of clear it out. And of course, when you're playing with this Candelabra of Tanis, it also works really well with Mistress Factories because you can untap the Mistress Factory while it's attacking and then it can pump itself an additional time or you can just do all kinds of shenanigans with it. I'm also playing with deserts. The same idea, I can up, uh, untap the desert multiple times. If I am lucky enough to find an active library of Alexandria and a Candelabra of Tanis on the board together. I mean, oh boy, that's just nuts because I can then untap the Candelabra. I mean, use the Candelabra of Tanis to untap the library of Alexandria and I can like draw extra cards above like the one extra card I'm already drawing from uh, the library of Alexandria. So that will be just really nuts. So you can just do a lot of fun things with the Candelabra of Tanis. The problem with the candlestick though is that sometimes you have no purpose for it and it's just a lost card. You know, you've just got to wait to all the components kind of hit the board before you can really uh, take advantage of it and abuse it, you know, but it is a very, very powerful artifact. Now, if I've got all this mana, one of the main things that I can do, of course, with it is use it for my rocket launcher. Rocket launcher, of course, four to cast. You cannot use it to turn it comes into play, but after that, you can pay two mana to deal one damage to any target and it destroys itself at the beginning of the next end step. Now this beginning of the next end step is pretty important because it means that I can use it twice if I use it the right way because I can use it at the end of the end step of my opponent and then I get to keep it my entire turn until the next beginning of the end step, right? So I can basically use it twice, which is really cool. And of course, uh, the rocket launcher works really well with the Tron Candelabra uh, a combo if I can assemble those pieces. Now, if I don't have my rocket launcher, that's also fine when you're looking at this list there are a lot of artifacts in here with a high casting cost, right? I'm playing two Sword of the Ages. Sword of the Ages, awesome card, six to cast, comes into play tapped. When it untaps, you can tap and sacrifice an X amount of creatures and deal damage equal to their power to any target. The thing is, the creatures though and the sword, they are removed from the game, unfortunately. I mean, if they would go to the graveyard, this card would be so much more useful, but I still think it's good in this deck because I'm playing with Juggernauts who have five power. I'm playing, you know, with all those bigger creatures that all have four power, 
Juggernaut's have five power, like I said, and I'm also playing with the Colossus of Sardia, which is a nine nine, right? So if I could get a Colossus on the board at a certain point, sack it to the sword, then it doesn't even have to deal combat damage. There, there's nine damage right there. And if I can just combine it with a Juggernaut, I already have 14 damage, right? That is quite a lot of damage. So I think Sword of the Ages will do really well in here. I'm also playing with the uh, one Mirror Universe. I think Mirror Universe in decks like this is quite important. Because, you know, you can fall behind so quickly while you try to assemble all your pieces. I don't have access to bolt or to swords. There's not really a way for me to quickly dispose of a creature. So when I'm playing against a more aggressive deck, Mirror Universe could come in really handy. So that when I'm almost dead, hopefully just in time, you know, I can uh, swap life totals with the Mirror Universe. Um, then, of course, I'm also playing here with Taunus's Coffin, which has really nice synergy with Tetravis and with uh, Triskelion. Maybe you wonder why. Well, I can put a creature in the coffin, then I can untap my coffin again. And when the creature comes out of the coffin, all the enter the battlefield triggers happen again. So my Triskelion comes into play with three plus one plus one counters on it. If it's uh, coming out of the coffin, the same thing happens. So I can just like save up a lot of counters. I can make a really big trike or I can make a really big Tetravis. So again, um, th the thing with this is that you do need a lot of time. So this deck... It needs some time. And of course, to kind of accelerate this, I am playing with all the Moxons. So hopefully the Moxon can help me to go really quick. And hopefully, you know, I can assemble Tron really quick. If not, I am playing with one Jalen Tome to kind of quickly go through my deck. I'm also playing with two JM Day Tomes. What I really like is the synergy between Suchi and JM Day Tome. When Suchi dies, you get four mana. The problem is Suchi often dies in combat, meaning you can only use those four mana for fast effects or to cast instants or interrupts. And that's not always possible, right? But of course, with a book, I can always use that four mana to draw a card with my Jam Day Tome. So having a Suchi in play with a Jam Day Tome, it is always a great feeling because then when your opponent kind of disenchants your Suchi on your end step, you're like, okay, fine, you know, I get, I get a card from it. You know, I'm fine, I can use it for my book. And it's kind of a feel good for me and a feel bad for my opponent. And that's why I really like that synergy. And of course, I love drawing cards. Anyway, uh, this is my deck. I'm really looking forward to show it to you on the channel. I hope it's going to do all the crazy stuff that I have in my mind. Let's hope it works. And now let's take a look at the deck of my opponent. And here we see the deck of Anna. So I've called it Caracas Legends because I feel this deck is really built around the land Caracas. So Caracas is a super interesting land. It can tap for one white. It's a legendary land from Legends, but it also has a second ability. You can tap it to return target legendary creature to your hand. So that means you can use it to protect your legendary creatures. And in this deck, we see deck and black blade. We see Hazas on Tamar, two of those, and we see three Stang in this deck. So there are quite a lot of legendary creatures in the deck. Now, maybe first start with Stang because there is something interesting happening there. Stang is one red, one green, and four to cast for a three, four creature. And when it comes into play, it creates a Stang twin token, which is also a legendary creature, right? So you've got two, three, four creatures on the board for the price of one. Now, the downside, though, is if the token dies or the stang dies, then both of the creatures are destroyed, right? So they're linked together. Now, the cool thing is you can do something against that link by using the Karaka. So I can cast my stang, and while the copy is still on the stack, the copy trigger, I can send the original stang back to my hand, and I still get the 3-4 token. Now, this doesn't work optimal because... If you would then cast the Stang again, the Stang would make another copy token, but that copy token is a Stang token legendary uh, creature, so it would then, by the legendary rule, destroy the old token creature, right? So it's not like you can build up a lot of token creatures, you will also always just have two, but it does take away that link. So what you could do, of course, is play your Stang, bounce it back to your hand, and you would have one original token to kind of do with as you please, right? And then next turn, you can play it out again. So maybe you've got some sack engine, for example, with Diamond Valley. You can, you know, just generate life, basically, which is really nice. Each turn, you can make four life, which is kind of nice. Um, then when we're looking at the other legendary creatures, we see Hazazon Tamar. Now, Hazazon Tamar works super, super good with Karakas. And the reason is, remember, with Karakas, you can bounce your Hazazon. So when Hazazon comes into play, you create X11 Sand Warrior creature tokens uh, at the beginning of your next turn's upkeep, where X is the number of lands you control at that time. So when you cast Hazazon, there's a delayed trigger. That's what basically is happening. Now, the thing is, when Hazazon leaves the battlefield, exile all the Sand Warrior tokens. The thing is, what you could do is you can cast your Hazazon and while the delay trigger is still on the stack, you can use your Karakas, 
bounce the hustle zone of Tamar back, and then the next turn you will get the X Sand Warrior tokens, and they are not linked to your original hazards on Tamar, which is now in your hand. So you can cast it again, and you can make, again, a lot of Sand Warrior tokens. Now, do remember, this is kind of slow because it happens at the next upkeep, the beginning of your next upkeep, so not your opponent's. So you do have to wait a full turn, but this is a way to, of course, generate tons of Sand Warrior tokens. So that is and really cool and kind of scary for me. Now, then we have the last legendary creature here in this list, which is Deccan. Black Blade, right? So Deccan has power toughness equal to the amount of lands you have um, under your control. And I guess that's it is what it is. So it's just going to be a really big creature. And I guess for Karakas here, it has the role of protecting the Deccan Black Blade. If I try to, for example, play a Sword Supply Shares on the Deccan, he can simply bounce it back to his hand and recast it again. So the Karakas makes it really difficult for me to get rid of the legendary creatures. And when we're looking at this list, he really wants to win with the legendary creatures. I guess his only other out is playing a fireball. He's playing with one fireball. So he could just maybe burn me out. Maybe if I can get kind of like control over the legendary creatures, kind of get that in check, he'll probably burn me out at the end of the day. But I think my main strategy will be to just, you know, play out a lot of my creatures, just put a lot of pressure on because I'm playing with the Suchis and the Juggernauts and, you know, the trikes. So I just have way more creatures than he does. So maybe that's a way of getting to victory. But this deck, I have to say, Anna, it's um, it's looking like a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to play against it. Talking about that, we've discussed my deck. We've looked at Anna's deck. That means we're ready. Let's go to the match. Game number one. Here we go. So it's Anna on the play here. He's playing with this Caracas Legends deck. So five colors. Starting here with a Tropical Island passing the turn. So no turn one. Uh, for example, Birds of Paradise, that's good news for me. And I'm playing with a mono a brown deck, so it's all artifacts. Playing with Tron Lands, I've called it Tonus's Toy Store. I'm starting with a Power Plant here, passing the turn to Anna. There we see that Birds of Paradise and a Plateau, and a pass. Let's see if I can assemble Tron. There is a Urza's Mine. Okay, so that's pretty good. So I've got a Power Plant and a Mine. So now, of course, I'm hoping to draw into that tower, or maybe I have it in hand already. That would mean I could generate seven mana next turn, if that's the case. Pretty big if, though. Let's first see what Anna can do here. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank. And uh, his deck actually needs a lot of mana, if you look at his list, because he's playing with all those legendary creatures. They're quite costly. Hasa's on Tamar, Deccan Black Blade, Stang. And here we go, look at this, Black Lotus, cracking the Lotus, going for a Demonic Tutor, so I wonder what he's gonna look up. I hope not a Mind Twist, because he could twist me here for three, because he still has that one black floating from the Lotus. Looking at his hand as well. Going for an Ancestral Recall, so he's gonna draw three cards. Still have three open. So a very explosive start here by Anna, but not really getting any way, anywhere on uh, on terms of, you know, creating a board presence. Although, of course, he's now going to draw three cards with the Ancestral Recall. So that's going to give him some card advantage. So he's going to draw the three from the Recall. Let's see what he can do with it. Still has a one black floating, so it's got three mana. Okay, there's a soul ring. Use the one black mana for that. So he's got four. So I wonder what he can do with uh, with the four mana. Just passing the turn. So I feel kind of lucky here that he stumbled there. And there is a Mishra's workshop. So not a, a tower, but still it's good because now I've got five mana. Tapping the workshop and the mine, playing a Suchi. So this is really good for me. This is what I want to do. There's a quick disenchant though on the Suchi. Unfortunately, I don't have a Jam Tome or anything yet to use that four mana for. So that just disappears into the void, I guess. So let's see what my opponent can do here. Counting his mana. He's got five. If he has, has a land drop, he can go up to six. I believe Stang is six to cast, so that could be an option for him. There's a Pendlehaven. Is he going to cast a creature? That's the question. No, he's not passing the turn, so it's giving me some time here. 
And I've got the workshop, of course. If I can get another land, I have six, and I can start playing Tetravis, Triskelion, and like my bigger threats. There's a Mishra's factory. Let's see what I can do with the factory. Tapping six here. Okay, here we go. Probably Triskelion. Exactly. There's the trike. Four off in the deck. So it's a four four. Well, actually, a one one comes into play with three plus one plus one counters. And you can shoot those counters off to any target. So there's finally some pressure here on the board from my side. Anna still being on 20. I'm on 20 as well. Okay, choosing to kill the uh, the Birds of Paradise. Now remember, I am playing against a five color deck, right? So these birds are really good. There is a strip mine. I wonder if he's gonna strip the workshop. I mean, it's, it's a little bit too late, isn't it? Would still be a good target, but... If I then would have a tower in hand, that would just be brutal. So he's going to use his strip mine here on the power plant. Okay, so he wants to cancel out my Tron. Let's see what, I, uh, what I'm going to do. I could, of course, choose to animate the factory here, attack with factory and Triskelion, but then Anna will use the maze to probably send back the trike. I can still do two damage. Tapping six here, and look at that, I did have a tower in hand. So it was a very good decision, decision by Anna here to go for the power plant. And this is a Sword of the Ages. Which is an artifact from Legends. And it comes to play tapped as you can see. But when it untaps I can tap it and sack an X amount of creatures. And deal damage equal to their power to any target. So it's kind of a way to finish off your opponent. There is a Karakas. Let's see if Anna can play one of, one of his bigger legendary creatures. There we go, there's Stang. So that is pretty cool. So then he gets a Stang token and he sends Stang back to his hand. So there we kind of see that synergy that Anna wanted to cre uh, create with his deck. So he has the Stang token. Let's see what I can do. Of course, Stang is a 3-4, so that's not great for my 3-3 three, three, uh, Triskelion here. Playing a Strip Mine, stripping away the Karakas. That's really a key card, of course, in Anna's deck. He's got multiple in his deck, so but at least I got rid of one. Tapping four here for perhaps another Suchi. Exactly, there's another Suchi hitting the board. So just to give an idea of how powerful the Sword of the Ages actually is, if I now animate my factory and, and I can let it pump itself, I can already deal 10 points of damage with the Sword of the Ages. I mean, it does mean I lose all my creatures, so I'm not going to do it, but I mean, it would have Anna's life out of nowhere. There's another maze by Anna. Oh, that's difficult. And again, he's playing a Stang. So now I think that he's going to lose the Stang token. And I think he realizes that now as well. So we, uh, I remember this. We, we were reading the cards together. So this little trick is not going to work though. I mean, he can still play it. It just means that he's going to lose his one Stang token. And decides not to. So he's take it, he takes it back. Understandable. Untaps the mana. I mean, he could just keep it untapped. He could wait, for example, his uh, his Diamond Valley to start cashing in on some life. That could be an option. He could use it as a blocker. He's got two mazes of if as well. I mean, he's, he's in a pretty safe position. Trying to figure out what his options are. I mean, another thing could be just to play it out anyway and say, you know, I'm just going to lose the token. That's still an option. Let's see what he's going to do. And it looks like he's just going to attack with it. Blocking it here. So does he have another plan with it here? He's going to die. Nope. And then he's going to recast the Stang. He's going to have it back again. So I guess he was kind of trying just uh, to test out the water, see what I would do. But of course, I know that he has that other Stang in hand. Perhaps he could have had like a Bolt or a Giant Grove and he could have killed my Suchi. Anyway, playing my Candelabra of Tanis here. That's actually good with that Mishra's Workshop, right? I can tap the Workshop for three, untap it again, tap it again. I can generate some extra mana. 
And I look at that, that's exactly what I'm doing here, untapping, so I've got six mana to cast something. Remember, the mana from the workshop can only be used to cast artifacts. Playing a Suchi here. And I think it probably would have been better if, if all I'm gonna do with the workshop mana is play a Suchi is just to tap the, the workshop and the uh, and the mine just to cast the Suchi without using the Candelabra because now I have the same result but I've got my Candelabra tapped. I mean, it doesn't matter much, but maybe I just wanted to show the Candelabra. I mean, it's one of those cards that spends way too much time in my binder, so I love to use it. There we see a Disenchant. I wonder what he's gonna Disenchant. There's so many targets for him here. Could go, of course, for a 4-4 Suchi. Could go for the Candelabra. Could go, yeah, of course, Sword of the Ages could be an option as well. I mean, Sword of the Ages could be risky. I wonder if I want to use it. Looks like I'm going to sack a Suchi here, of course, to kill the Stang, because by killing one of the Stangs, you also kill the other. So killing two birds with one stone, although it's also going to cost me my Sword and my Suchi. And uh, doing that little trick again with the uh, workshop and the Candelabra of Tonnage, generating six mana, also playing a Mock Sapphire. Play out a Juggernaut here. And what else am I going to do? Animating here. Nope. Oh, I'm going to use the two mana and the two mana to, to cast a Rocket Launcher. For a moment there, I thought I was animating the Mistress Factory, but I'm not. Playing the Rocket Launcher, so Rocket Launcher also a dangerous artifact to play against, but right now I don't have a lot of mana. Rocket Launcher is four to cast. You cannot use it to turn it comes to play and you can pay two and then it deals one damage to any target and it's destroyed at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So obviously if I can get Tron and I have the Candelabra and I can generate tons of mana, it's really good, but right now as it sits, it's not very, uh, it's not doing much, it's not very dangerous. Anyway, attacking here with everything, and now I can show the synergy actually with the uh, Mishra's Factory. I could untap the Factory with the Candelabra of Tanis, and I could pump it up an extra time dealing three points of damage. Not doing it though, that's kind of a missed opportunity here for me. Still dealing some damage, five damage, so I'm just gonna drop here to 15. But that was a bit of a missed opportunity also to show uh, the Candelabra of Taunus, you know. Using it again with the workshop to generate some mana. So, how many mana am I going to use? Four mana again. Okay, there's a Taunus's Coffin. So, the Coffin works really well with my Triskelion. Looks like I'm going to tap the Tower or not. No, I'm first going to attack. Look at that, attacking with everything. That means the two mana that I still had is gone now, by the way, exactly, taking it away now, dealing three damage to Ana here. I wonder why I kept Factory untapped. Oh, I want to use my Taunus' Coffin. Okay, so I'm going to put my Triskelion into the Coffin, so that's pretty sweet. So that means next turn I could untap the Coffin. What happens then is that the Trike comes out of the Coffin, tapped, but the ETB triggers trigger again, so it would come into play with six counters. Well, actually with three extra counters, so five in total because it only has two counters now. As you can see by looking at the dice. So this is not great for Anna. He has to find a way to get back into this game. Okay, Wheel of Fortune could do it, of course. Discarding my other Candelabra of Tanis here. Playing with two in the deck. Look at that deck and Black Blade going to the graveyard. And we're both going to draw seven fresh cards. And Anna still has enough mana to do a lot after that. What would be perfect for him, of course, is finding a time walk. Then he could potentially cast something, play the time walk, you know, start a turn again with a really well-stocked hand, play out some more stuff and maybe completely take over the game. There's a disenchant. Okay, that's a pretty good start. So disenchant on the Taunus's Coffin. It does mean that the Trike comes back into play with additional counters, so it's now a 6-6 Triskelion.
The trick with the Tonsus Coffin, by the way, I probably shouldn't share this, but is playing a disenchant if you have it, of course, because Ana didn't have it. But but when I activate the Tonsus Coffin to put a creature, uh, when, when the trigger is on the stack that you put the creature into the coffin, then play a disenchant on the coffin because then the coffin is no longer there, but and the creature just disappears. It, it stays into exile. So that's really a, a neat little way to kind of cancel that Tonsus Coffin uh, trick. But again, then you do need to have that uh, artifact removal at the right time. I'm playing a, a Library of Alexandria here. I've got seven cards in hand. Do I? No. Seven? Oh, of course, because of the uh, Wheel of Fortune. Wow, and now I can use Candelabra of Taunus in combination with Library of Alexandria. This is insane. So drawing two extra cards. I mean, one card is already insane, but now drawing two extra cards with the Candelabra of Tannis, this is a big problem for Ana. Six mana in the mana pool, by the way, uh, by my workshop here. Let's see what I can do. Now remember, I can only use those six to cast artifacts, but that's not a problem with, uh, with my deck, of course. Using, okay, playing a Mox Ruby first. Using nine mana. Oh, do I have a Colossus of Sardia? Wow. That is fantastic. Colossus of Sardia hitting the board. And if that Sword of the Ages now would still would have still been there, I could have won the game just with the sword alone. But Colossus of Sardia, awesome. To see it here hitting the board, the 9-9 trample creature. Going to combat, by the way, here, attacking with the Juggernaut, the Trike, and the Suchi. Now remember, Ana does have two mazes of if. So I think he's in still in a pretty good shape. He could choose to chump, of course, with the Birds of Paradise as well. So he's going to use the Mazes first. And it looks like he's going to chump the Trike with the Birds of Paradise. Still taking some damage. It's not quite clear where that damage is coming from, to be honest. But he, dro he dropped till 2.13. Because I believed he was chum blocking with the bird. There is Hazaz on Tamar. Oh, that's so awesome. Hazaz on Tamar hitting the board. Unfortunately for Ana, he doesn't have a Karakas to make full abuse of it. But it's still pretty cool to see. He's got two, four, six, seven lands. So next upkeep, he'll get seven Sand Warrior creature tokens. And I mean, is it going to win him the game? No, but it's going to keep him alive. He can jump with them when he finds a Karakas. He can, you know, play a really cool ping pong game with it. You know, get a lot of tokens and eventually maybe win. He still has a lot of problems though, because I've got the Library of Alexandria that I can use twice because of my Candelabra of Tannis. I mean, if I can find some trike, I've got the, um, the rocket launcher. So there are just a lot of problems here. But for now, I mean, on this little bit of a better position than he was. Anyway, I've got eight cards in hand now, playing out another card, seven. So probably gonna untap. Yeah, gonna do that trick again. So gonna use my Candelabra of Tannis here to untap my Loa, use it again. So gonna tap it, gonna go to eight, and I'm still looking for that final Tron land. I need a power plant to get it active. Eight cards in hand at the moment, three mana floating from the workshop. I mean, I'm in a really good position here. Playing an Icy Manipulator. Ooh, I could use that to tap down one of the mazes. That is problematic for Ana. I mean, it was already problematic for him, but it's only going to be worse. Look at that, tapping the Hazazon. That kind of surprises me, to be honest. Animating everything attacking here. Well, maybe I wanted to tap it because I want to attack with the factory as well. Anyway, using his two mazes here on the two biggest creatures, he still takes 11 points of damage. He's going to drop to two. Wow. And then I can kill him, of course, with the tri counters. Yeah, it's over. It's over. I think, I mean, okay, he can, he can net some life. Can he survive this, actually? Gain four life from the Hazazon. Yeah, he can survive. So I've used two counters from the trike, so my trike is still a 4-4. 
Yeah, that's what we're discussing. So my Triskelion is still a 4-4, because now Anna is no longer on lethal, so I'm not gonna use the other counters. And uh, he's on four. I mean, he survived because of the Diamond Valley. And remember, he does get all the tri-counters. The problem, of course, for him is that the rocket launcher is still there. Could have used the rocket launcher? Yeah, easily, because he still have the three points from the trike. And then I have the rocket launcher. But let's let's wait and see. Maybe he can fight. He's got one more draw step to go. Who knows? I mean, it ain't over till it's over. Only have the one Sapphire, though. So, I mean, Anna survives one more turn. I mean, that's pretty good. I didn't expect that. So, there's his Sand Warrior token. Token, I guess. Uh, seven of those now. Bit of a blurry image, but now it's back. Draw the card for turn. What can he do? Also has the Pendle Haven, by the way. He could use the Pendle Haven to make one of the tokens bigger, then use the Diamond Valley net an extra three life. That's not too bad. After blocks are declared, of course, then he can still use it as a blocker. He still has the two mazes of if. Yeah, I think the biggest problem for him here is really the, the direct damage with the trike and the uh, rocket launcher here. If you could find like a dust to dust to get rid of both, Oh, funny, now I see that the token is token <laughs> from South Park. I couldn't see it at first because the image was kind of blurry. Here we see a Mind Twist. Mind Twist, of course, a brilliant card normally, but now with Anna's back against the wall, it's actually not going to help him much. Yes, I lose my hand, but, you know, everything I need is on the board. Three cards for Anna. Looks like he's, he's passing the turn. Okay, so I could... Win this now with my rocket launcher and my Triskelion counters. Unless, of course, he's got... But he doesn't have white mana anymore. If he would have had a swords and he could swords the token, pump it up to three. I don't think he can. Okay, now I finally have Tron, by the way. So we saw the thumbs up by Anna. Yeah, we just, we had a lot of fun playing this, actually. We were talking a lot about the options that we had. And uh, it's really nice for me that I get to uh, show you guys the Candelabra. So now I do that trick where I generate mana. So now I've got 11 mana, 12 mana, and I can deal 4.6 points of damage actually to Ana. So uh, that's more than enough. I also still have the trike. And uh, that means a victory for me, even though I'm still like adding up mana, but not sure why, because I've already won, but okay. Generating 14 mana, so that's 7 points of damage with my rocket launcher. And he can make 1, 2, 3 and eat it up, go up to 7, and takes exactly 7. So I guess that's why I wanted it to be 14 mana. I wanted to really kill him with the rocket launcher and not use the counters from the Triskelion. But uh, yeah, pretty, pretty interesting first game. It was a long game, <laughs> definitely. I think both of these decks are very grindy. Uh, and Anna got to show his uh, Caracas Hazazon trick, so that was pretty sweet as well. And remember, it's only 1-0, so we still have at least one more game to go. Game number two, here we go. So it's Anna on the play after losing that first one. There's a City of Brass, Ancestral Recall. That is a pretty sweet opener, playing that on my upkeep. So he's going to go up a couple of cards. That's a really nice uh, play here by Anna. In the meanwhile, I'm starting my turn playing out a Mitra's Factory here and into a Soul Ring. Okay, that's pretty good. That means next turn, I'm gonna have that magical four mana if everything goes according to plan. Perhaps there's gonna be a disenchant by Anna, who knows? But if I can hit the four, I can put some pressure on the board. I've got four Juggernauts and four Suchis in the deck. Let's see what my opponent can do first. Of course, just drew uh, three cards with that Ancestral Recall. There's a Karakas, so important card in his deck. And he's discarding a Taiga. So it has to discard. Didn't find, for example, a Mox that would become quite nice. There is an Urza's Tower. So I've got four mana tapping four here. What am I gonna cast? There's a Juggernaut, so 5-3 Powerhouse. 
So this can become very painful for Anna or not. Of course, there's a quick swords to plowshares answering this uh, threat. It does mean I go up to 25, passing the turn on to Anna. And there is a Savannah and a pass. So he's really giving me time here to build up again. There's an Urza's power plant, so I only need the mine for Tron. Gonna tap four again. What are we gonna see? There's a Jam Day Tome. So that's a book, and if I can then get uh, Tron, I will be able to end draw a card and, and potentially play creatures out as well. And again, Anna just passing the turn here. Not finding any ramp in his deck. No Moxen, no Soul Ring, no Black Lotus. And it looks like I'm not finding the Urza's Mine that I need to complete Tron here. I do, I do find a uh, Mishra's Factory, it seems. So I can animate and I can attack, but that's of course a risk opening myself up to uh, exactly, for example, a Disenchant. Disenchant here on the Gem Day Tome. It's an understandable decision. At least it gave me a card and it ate up a Disenchant, which is good. There's the pass by Anna. There's a Desert, so... I mean, I've got seven mana. It's quite a lot. It looks like I'm animating both of my factories here with the Soul Ring. No, I'm not just animating one and attacking with it, pumping it up to three. So I guess I want to keep four mana. Do I have another four drop? I do. There's a Suchi. Four, four, hitting the board. So more pressure after the Juggernaut. There's a Suchi. And of course, I still have the two factories. I'm currently on 16. I'm still on 25. After that, Swords on my Juggernaut. And Anna not really doing anything yet, just uh, taking care of business here with another source. Doing what white can do so well, which is destroying things, removing things from the game. Having access to disenchant and swords to plowshares, of course. Ooh, there's a black lotus. Does this mean another legend hitting the board? Tapping seven, it seems. Gonna go to 15. Brain Geyser, okay, that is really good. That can get him right back into this match. I feel like Ana really needed this. Refilling his hand, having options again. It's gonna go through his hand now, try to see. Perhaps there's a Mox in there that he can drop. Has already played, okay, didn't play a land for turn. For a moment I thought he already did. So playing a Savannah, passing the turn. But it makes sense, if Anna was on the play and he played a land every turn, he should be on six. And I'm on the draw, so now I'm gonna go to six. And look at that again, a Library of Alexandria not, is not going to be as good as it was in game one with the Candelabra of Tanis and Loa on the battlefield. That was just sick. For now, I'm not gonna really use the Loa. I've got four cards in hand. You can see that by the little red dice there at the bottom. So it's not really gonna help me. Seven cards in hand, by the way, for my opponent, Anna. And Anna is now on 11 after taking a double hit from the factory. So that's a bit of a problem for him. Let's see if he can make this into an actual game and he can start, you know, playing out some threats or perhaps dealing with the factories. He's got the mana. Does he have the creatures? That's the big question here. I mean, playing a Hazazon would be quite nice. But it looks like he's not really doing anything. I wonder what options he has. You see him going through the cards, thinking about it. But it looks like he's just passing the turn. So no action. That is curious. So I've got five cards now. Perhaps he's keeping some disenchants or some other removal open for when I animate the factories. Really wonder what's gonna happen here. So five cards in hand. Looks like I've got some options as well. Tapping the soul ring here just to animate the factories. That's the question, or am I gonna play something out? I mean, the fact that he didn't play out anything really kind of concerns me. Okay, tapping four, so I guess I'm gonna play something. There's an Icy Manipulator. I mean, and just 
Am I just passing the turn? I am, and then in his upkeep, I'm tapping something interesting. I mean, why am I not just attacking? And also, why am I playing out the Icy Manipulator? I could have, you know, just kept it in hand, tried to get up to the seven, because I've got the Library of Alexandria out there. And look at this, Ana doing something. There is Hazazon Tamar hitting the board. So remember, this card from Legends is gonna give Ana 1-1 one, one Warrior Sand Tokens equal to the amount of lands that he has at the beginning of his next turn's upkeep. So he's got two, four, seven, eight. So he's gonna get eight Sand Warrior tokens next turn. That is something. And he has also the Karakas, although I tapped down the Karakas with the Icy Manipulator. There is a desert. So I've got some deserts here to kill some potential sand warriors, which is a complete flavor fill, I admit it. Oh, look at that. And now my deserts even become better with the Candelabra of Tana, so I can untap them again, use them again, so I can use four activations from the deserts now because of that Candelabra of Tana. So potentially I could kill four sand warrior tokens if Ana attacks with them. Now, you know, I have to say that uh, you know, this may not be ideal for Ana to attack you with the uh, with the Sand Warrior token. So I don't think he's going to, but just to give you an idea. Passing the turn here. Look, oh no, I'm animating now. Wow, interesting. Am I going to attack? Playing Okay, playing a Chaos Orb. I'm not animating, I guess. Playing a Chaos Orb instead. I could flip on Hazazon Tamar. I could also wait with that because I first want to have the... Oh, it looks like I'm going to do it now. Or am I going to flip on a Karakas? That's something I could do as well. At least it's a hit. I have no idea what I'm flipping on. Okay, I'm flipping on the Karakas. That's it. I don't think that's a good decision. Because what I could have done is I could have tapped the Karakas again. You know? And just see if Ana wanted to do anything in response. Right? And if he doesn't, then in my... When the, the Sand Warrior tokens hit the board, I can flip on the Hazazon. Because when the Hazazon dies, so do the Sand Warrior tokens. So, yeah. Not really that impressed with my line of play here. But anyway, the Karakas is gone. I still have the Icy Manipulator. I've got the Deserts to potentially kill some Sand Warrior tokens. I've got the two Factories. So I'm not that worried at the moment about the current board state. And if Ana has another Karakas in hand, one of the things that he could do though is just attack with all the Sand Warriors. And yeah, a lot of them will die, but it also will take some damage. And then after that, he can play Karakas, bounce the Hazazon, and just play the Hazazon again. Okay, there's a maze. So that doesn't change too much. Just means it's gonna be even harder for me to find a way through. And I'm gonna tap the maze down here. Now remember that Candelabra of Tanis can also be used on the Mishra's factory. So for example, I could attack with one factory, make it a 3-3, untap both the factories, and uh, pump it up again. So potentially having a 5-5 attack. There's a Mishra's workshop. Again, works really good with the Candelabra of Tanis. A trike would be quite nice as well. Tapping four here. Okay, there's a book. Wow, that is really good. That book can give me some card advantage. One card in hand, by the way, so not a lot. Four cards in hand for my opponent, Anna. And passing the turn here. So yeah, really surprised about that Chaos Orb flip on the Karakas. I feel like if I would have just tapped the Karakas, flipped on the... Uh, Hazazon instead it would have been a different game and I still could have attacked now but now kind of the board's clocked up so that's no longer an option playing out a demonic tutor here going to 10 wonder what he's gonna look up already played out the ancestral recall I only have one card in hand so I assume it's not a mind twist also played out the brain geyser perhaps a regrowth 
to get one of those cards back. I mean, a Brain Geyser would be great with all the mana that he has, so regrow Brain Geyser is definitely an option. So we'll just have to wait and see what did Anna pick up from that Demonic Tutor. That is one of the many questions. Ooh, he's gonna tap quite a lot. Okay, there's a Stang, that's pretty cool. So he's got two, three, fours now. So I mean, his board is very full and it's kind of done for me in terms of trying to attack and find a way through. All I could do really is hope for some flyers. I am playing with uh, two Tetravuses in the deck. And of course I have the book as well to draw extra cards. So I mean, it's not bad, but I feel like Ana is gaining momentum. Three cards in hand now. Am I gonna find the Urza's Mind to, to get Tron? I mean, it's not the most important, but when you play Tron, you kinda wanna get to that point at a certain moment in the game. So I've got three cards in hand here. Just passing the turn. So probably just wanna do draw a card end step and I see end step. There's a Mox Ruby. Oh, there's a Diamond Valley. Now this Diamond Valley changes a lot. You know, Ana being on 10, you know, it's not that low, but it's, it's low enough that, for example, a Sword of the Ages and a couple of creatures can seal the deal. But now probably, and there's a full on attack here by Ana, by the way. Wow, look at that. Eight Sand Warrior tokens, two, three, four stacks. Okay, he's taking it back. Oh, because I can, of course, use my Icy before he attacks. I'm going to tap one Stang down, it seems. And the rest is coming full throttle here. And am I going to block here with my factories? Now, I'm still on 29 life, though, but there's a Stang Twin token, a Hazazon, and eight Sand Warrior tokens coming my way. I could, of course, start chewing off the Sand Warrior tokens and just take a lot of damage, but, you know, kill a lot of Sand Warrior tokens in the process. So I'm gonna kill, I'm just, I guess I'm gonna block one Sand Warrior token each. Am I? Oh no, look at this, I'm gonna do something else. So now they're 4-4, four, four, so they can kill the Stang Twin token and the Hazas on Tamar. That would be quite disastrous for Omni here. It would mean he loses all his uh, tokens. After damage is dealt, of course, but still. Okay, it looks like I'm just blocking the one Stang token. He's eating up the Stang token. Yes, and I'm eating up, and I'm blocking here the Hazazon. Or not, it's, we just have to wait till the dust settles. Okay, he's taking it out of combat with the maze. Of course, that's something he can do. That means they, they stay alive. I'm taking the damage here from the Sand Warrior tokens. After damage is dealt, I'm gonna use my deserts to kill two Sand Warrior tokens. And he's dealt quite a lot of damage. Eight points of damage, going from 29 to 21. And he's gone up four life, sacking the Stang to the Diamond Valley. But this was really nice, uh, a nice thing to, to see, right? That I've used that Candelabra to double pump, basically the factory. So all of a sudden, because of the Candelabra of Tanas, I have four, four factories to block with instead of three, three factories. It's kind of uh, insane. Kind of gross, actually. And Ani here tapping some more lands. What's he gonna do? Does he have another draw seven? Another Wheel of Fortune. We already saw one in uh, in game number one. I've got three cards. Ani has four cards. There's a City of Brass. Oh, look at this, tapping so much. There's a fireball, ho ho! And he's killing both of my Mishra's factories with that fireball. That is actually really good. And uh, I'm starting to get worried here because look at the situation now. You know, I'm on 21, but I've got no creatures. I've got nothing to deal damage with. I have one Icy, so I could tap down the Hazazon. But I mean, 
There are still six one ones there on the side of Alna. I do have those deserts though, but remember, I can only use them after I've taken the damage. Alna really needs like a, a Pendlehaven or some kind of anthem effect to make his 1-1 uh, one, one tokens bigger. Now, the cool thing about the Sand Warrior tokens is they're red, green, and white. So you can use a Gauntlet of Might, but you can also use a Crusade, like all that buffs them. Which is pretty cool. You could use Jacques Le Vert probably, right? Because they're also green creatures. There's a Time Twister. Oh, I really enjoy how on this playing this, you know, he doesn't mind just playing those draw sevens out. He's like, I just want to go for it. And then Fireball was very good as well. And now he's shuffling the Fireball back in, by the way, because that's his alternative win con, right? He wants to win with Sand Warrior tokens or with, you know, Deccan Blackblade, who we haven't seen yet. But if that doesn't work, he can just make a giant Fireball. So both of us shuffling up. I've got two cards that are removed from the game because of the Swords to Plowshare. So you see them there, the Suchi and the Juggernaut. So 21 life for me. We both have seven new cards, 12 life for Anna. I mean, I'm just gonna say it again. If Anna can find a Karakas, he can just attack with the tokens. And he's like, okay, you're gonna kill a few with the Candelabra of Tannis, but I'm just gonna bounce my Hazazan. I'm gonna play it again and just gain a lot more uh, tokens again. So he doesn't really mind then that I kill a few. And now, of course, my... Oh, there we see the Karakas. There's the Soul Ring, okay. But that, of course, that Karakas can change a lot here. He's gonna tap three, kind of tap... Ooh, what's he gonna do? Tapping quite a lot here. Are we gonna see another Stang? Oh, there's Deccan Blackblade. So Deccan Blackblade has power and toughness equal to the amount of lands. Unfortunately for Anado, I do have that Icy Manipulator, so I can just tap it down, but still... It's huge, right? It's 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, it's an 11, 11. If only you could find a way to get rid of my Icy, you can just swing in for 11 next turn. That would be sick. Figuring out what to do next. I think he's gonna attack here with the tokens. He is, he's gonna attack with all of it. Ooh, changing his mind though. Untapping it for a moment there, I thought it was going to swing in again. Now remember, my life total is still really high because of that double sorts earlier in the game, right? On the Suchi and the Juggernaut. There's the attack. Gonna take 8 damage. Oh, look at my life total. I was on 29 not too long ago. Now I'm on 13. So I'm going to use one desert activation here. I mean, I should use both, right? I'm not quite sure why I only use one. Okay, I'm gonna use a second. Maybe I thought I could draw a card with the Loa, untap it, draw again. Um, but I don't think it works that way. But let me know in the comments if I made a mistake. So I draw, I go to eight, right? And I cannot untap and draw in between, I think, with the Candelabra of Tana. So I have to go back down to seven, untap it, and then I can use it again. Anyway, nine cards in hand now, but I'm not quite sure about that. And there's an Urza's Mind, so finally I've, uh, I've got uh, Tron together. That's about time. Really curious now, I can make so much mana. Look at this, tapping seven from the lands. Oh, of course, tapping the Soul Ring as well. So nine mana and three mana from the Workshop. Now I'm gonna keep the Workshop mana and the other mana divided because the workshop mana can only be used to cast artifacts. So for example, I cannot use the mana for my gem day total. So that's why I'm keeping them separate here. So I've got nine mana in total from the Tron Lance. And it looks like I'm now gonna untap everything. Or of course, wait a minute, I gotta use my Loa first, untap my Loa as well for the extra cards. So I gotta play a card out of my hand. So this is still my first main, by the way. I mean, this deck can be complicated, especially when you have so many cards in it. I've got eight cards in hand. 
I can make tons of mana. I, I can use my Loa twice if I want to. There's just a lot of options. And look at this playing out in Icy Manipulator. So now I've got eight mana still. Going to draw an extra card. Going to go back up to eight. Now I'm probably going to... Exactly. Now I'm going to use my Candelabra to untap five lands. So I'm going to go to three mana still floating. And if I now play out something else, I can again use my Library of Alexandria because I just untapped it. So this is perfect for me. I'm asking how big the deck and black blade is. I mean, I can already tell you now that it's big enough that you might want to keep one of the icy manipulators untapped with the mana to spend. I'm a little bit in the tank here. I probably want to do too much. Tap four here, right? Okay, there's a uh, rocket launcher, which is really good right now on this board because I've got so much mana. Now remember, you cannot use the rocket launcher to turn it comes into play, so I have to wait a whole turn. But after that, it could be a problem for Anna. But Anna, of course, has the Diamond Valley, you know, and that's gonna guarantee him a lot of life. So this game could, could take quite long, actually. Seven cards in hand here. I've used the Library of Alexandria already twice. Still have two mana floating. I could tap my Tron Lance for seven. That means nine mana if I add up the mana from the Candelabra of Thomas. Eight, ten mana. Wow. Am I going to play out exactly ten mana? So I'm going to play out a Suchi. And a Tetris. Okay, so now the, the mana's gone. The 10 mana spent, exactly. Bye-bye. I need to keep the deserts untapped because I need to tap that uh, deck and black blade, of course. So Tetris, a 1-1 one, one flyer that comes to play with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters. And the fact that it's a flyer is a pretty big deal. Ooh, do you see a Disenchanto, but on an Icy Manipulator. And the reason why it's such a big deal is because Ana has no flyers. So if I can use an Icy to tap down a maze... Then it can attack for 4 damage through the air, and Anna is already on 11. And, you know, that's going to be difficult for him, and I, I'm going to force him to start sacking creatures to his own Diamond Valley. That's where I want to want this game to go to. Anyway, Anna here playing a Plateau. It looks like he's just passing the turn. Or not. Maybe that was wishful, wishful thinking from my part. So he's on 11. What is he going to do? He is attacking here. Look at that. Very gutsy move. Before his attack though, I tap something which could change his mind, right? I remember back in the day when we used to play, you would first say, I'm going to attack with this, this, and this, and then I could use my Icy Manipulator. But now because tapping has become part of the combat, you have to use Icy before combat. So the way it works is your opponent says, I want to go into combat, and then I have to decide what to tap. In this case, it's easy, the Black Blade, but of course it does have an effect. Anna can then choose, do I still want to attack? So there's the attack with the four tokens. So I guess I could kill two tokens here and use a desert to kill most of the tokens. So I think Anna wants to bounce the Hazazon again anyway. So yeah, blocking two of them, taking two damage. I mean, still two damage. Going to drop to 11. Going to kill another one. He's got one left. I mean, he could eat that one if he wants to. And then, you know, bounce the Hazazon. Play the Hazazon again. But perhaps he wants to keep the Diamond Valley untapped, though. Because you never know. If I get some way to deal more damage than he's expecting, maybe he needs to sack the Black Blade for a lot of life. Look at the amount of mana that he has. He's got so much. Is he just gonna hard cast another one? Okay, there we see. Oh, he's gonna eat the Hazazon. So I guess he's got the second one in hand, right? Is it gonna go up to 15? Because Hazazon is a 2 4, so you gain life equal to the toughness of the creature. Gonna tap a lot of stuff. I guess we're gonna see another Hazazon. Exactly, another Hazazon. Tamar hitting the board, and that means that next turn. 
he's gonna get a lot of Sand Warrior tokens. And this is getting very concerning for me because I'm on 11. You know, I mean, yes, look at my board state. I've got, I've got all the card draw, I've got all the power, but I mean, if I'm dead, it's gonna be use, useless for me. So next turn, it has to happen, right? The good news here is for me is that I'm gonna tap down to Diamond Valley to gain life from the Haza Zone, which means he can no longer use it to, to sack uh, the Black Blade because the Black Blade, that really gives you a lot of life. So he's on 15, so I have to find a way to deal 15 damage. What I can do is I can tap the Mace, I can hit him for four, put him on 11, that would mean I need 22 mana. I don't think I can get 22 mana, to be honest. I don't think I can make that. And the reason I'm saying I need 22 mana is, of course, because of the rocket launcher, right? I mean, two mana for one damage, so 22 mana equals 11 damage. And if I attack on it with my flying Tetravis, if I tap down the mace, he would go to 11. But I probably shouldn't do that if I cannot kill him. So I'm in an... Uh, uh, I'm, we're in an interesting spot in the game. I want to say I'm in an interesting spot here, but... The same goes for Ana. I mean, this is really an exciting game number two. Very strategical. And maybe I want to keep my rocket launcher as well to kill the Hazazan next turn so that the Sand Warrior tokens disappear. And then there's actually not really a problem for me. The question is though, do I see it? And that's also one of the reasons that maybe you're wondering the players are playing a little bit slow. It's because we're talking a lot and also because these are two decks that we haven't played with a lot. This is my second time piloting this deck and I believe this is the first time that Anna is playing with his deck. So I've got seven and I'm gonna start drawing extra cards. You're gonna go up to eight. Probably gonna, you know, do the Candelabra thing again. Okay, there's another Tron land. It's, uh, it looks like it's a power plant. So that's two more mana. Seven uh, in hand again. So I can now... Okay, I'm first gonna attack it seems. Does that make sense though? Because he still has the maze. He's just gonna maze it. And he's gonna send it back. So if I want some damage, I should tap it first. I mean, remember, the deck in Black Blade also doesn't have uh, Trample or anything. So I can just jump block it as well, for example, on the Suchi. So really in the tank here, trying to find the perfect play. Because I, I probably, I just want to kill on a this turn. Oh, look at that. That is interesting. A Chaos Orb still have one mana floating. wonder what I'm gonna flip on. Okay, there we see the activation of the Karaka. So this is another thing. When you activate your, your uh, Chaos Orb, your opponent doesn't know. Ooh, that's a sloppy flip, but it's a hit. Okay, it was on the maze. Your opponent doesn't know what you're gonna target. So that's why you see on here using his Karakas to defend his black blade, he's like, okay, if you want to hit my black blade and it's off the board, he has to do that before he knows what the target is. Anyway, attacking here with the Tetravis and on the dropping to 11, but now the problem starts. The Sand Warrior tokens enter the game. Look at that 13 Sand Warrior tokens. And they're heading in my direction. Is this the end? That is the question, of course. I'm on 11. Still have that one IC. I got a blocker. Uh, I can use, of course, my rocket launcher to kill a few as well. There we see the recast of uh, Deck and Black Blade. What I need to do, by the way, is, of course, use my rocket launcher here on Hazazon, and then all my troubles are gone. Looks like Anna's gonna do something else first. There's a mirror universe. And there's a Loa as a last card. And of course the 
tokens still have summoning sickness though, so I've got one last turn. Looks like I'm gonna use the rocket launcher here on the uh, at the end of the end step of Anna. And uh, using my candelabra of Tanis here for this trick. So I can generate 14 mana it seems, so I'm going to use all of that onto the life total of Anna. Okay, that's going to be enough then to win the game. Okay, so I don't even have to target the Hazazon here. I actually thought that he was able to attack with the Sand Warrior tokens, but of course they have Summoning Sickness. So that means I'm going to win the game here it seems, Anna being on 3, although he does have the, the Deccan Blackblade that he can eat up with the diamond valley, right? Let's see how this is gonna play out. I'm curious now. Did we see that or did we miss that? I'm on 11, on this on three. Remember the rocket launcher is gonna destroy at the beginning of my next end step. So that's gonna happen this turn. I'm gonna draw card number eight. I mean, I'm playing so slow, I guess I guess I know that he still has that Diamond Valley. I mean, step one here would be to start generating a lot of mana again, exactly. So tapping everything again, gonna make nine mana. And again, using a separate dice for the workshop because I can only use that to cast artifacts. There's another Mox, seven in hand, so now I'm gonna untap. I mean, I'm drawing so many extra cards. So I should tap down the Candelabra of Taunus now, by the way, because I've used, uh, used it. I've got three mana floating, and I've got three mana floating from the workshop as well. Tap again, gonna go up to six. Am I gonna use that? Oh, I am, and now he's gonna sack the Diamond Valley. Look at that, so I'm gonna try to kill Ana on the second deck in Black Blade. And he's on 14 again. Now I've got six mana from the workshop. I'm gonna use it to play a Triskelion out, okay. So the try can kill a couple of those warrior tokens, but I really wonder if I see or know that I simply have to kill the Hazazan to get rid of the Sand Warrior tokens. I really wonder when that quarter is gonna drop and if it's gonna drop. I mean, I do believe I still have enough mana to generate to actually deal four points of damage to the Hazazon. Hazazon is a two four. But it looks like I'm just gonna play more creatures. This could be really problematic for me. I'm on 11, I mean, I've got the upper hand, right? I've got all the tools I need, but I seem to forget that all I have to do is destroy Hazazon here. I still have the rocket launcher. I have enough mana, but if I tap it for something else now, and I am tapping it for something else, oh, this is not smart. I'm playing my own mirror universe. Which you can see on a clapping because it's just funny to have two of these on a battlefield, but they don't really have an impact at the moment. Oh, but I feel so stupid right now looking back at this uh, because I have the mana to kill the Hazazan and then kill the Sand Warrior tokens that way and it's kind of over, right? And of course, on a response could bounce um, the Hazazan back to his hand, yes, but that would take a complete turn for him. He's got to recast the houses on, he has to wait a whole turn before he's got the Sand Warrior tokens again. So that would, that would definitely grant me the victory here. I mean, I guess for the game, this, this is more fun. Anna being on 14, I'm on 11, he can do a big strike here with 13 Sand Warrior tokens. And yes, I can kill a lot. Absolutely. But not all of them. And I'm gonna take some serious damage. But I've got the mirror universe, of course. So even if he deals that damage, I can change life totals. 
Oh man, this is really a difficult thing here because I have that 4-4 four, four flyer and on the... Okay, there's, there's the swords. This is really good for him. Good business. Sourcing the trike. That surprises me, to be honest. Yeah, of course, going for the Tetris. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So I am going to gain 4 life. I'm going to go back up to 15 and I got to remove that creature from the game as well. But it makes sense he's going for the flyer because he doesn't really have an answer to flying creatures. Only has the maze, and that maze is gone after that Chaos Orb flip. And now I've got three creatures, and he's got 13. But he needs to kill me with one go, because if he can, then I can use my mirror next turn, swap lives, and perhaps kill him then. Same thing goes for Anna, of course. You know, I need to kill him in one swing as well, because he also has a mirror universe. Looks like he's gonna pass the turn, so I'm gonna tap down the. Diamond Valley, okay, that makes sense, because if I then can get to a point where I can deal 14 damage, at least he cannot sack in response. Six cards in hand, and I'm gonna do the dance again, it seems, with the mana. I mean, the Candelabra of Taunus has been absolutely awesome this match. So just making tons of, tons of mana now. Gonna draw a card there with the Loa. So I've got three from the workshop and then I've got the mana from the Tron Lance, which is nine. And then I'm gonna untap everything again. So I'm gonna keep three mana floating and three mana from the workshop floating. If I can get, for example, like a Thomas's coffin and I can put the houses on in the coffin, life's looking really good all of a sudden. The question is, do I see it though? Okay, there's another rocket launcher. Now remember, the rocket launcher cannot be used to turn it comes into play. So yes, this is a great card, but not right now. I'm gonna draw another card. I'm gonna go up to eight again. I'm drawing so many cards, also with the Jam de Tome and with the Loa. I'm playing so much out, I should have won this game half an hour ago, but here we are. Take two mana off, tap two more six in total, cast another Triskelion. Seven in hand again. Oh, this is just, this is just crazy. This is just crazy stuff. I mean, look at these board states. They're just insane. Using my last three mana, it seems, and playing a ruby, so four in total. Okay, there is Thomas's coffin. Can we please? And I'm talking to myself here. Can you please put the houses on in the coffin, please? It is so funny to look back at yourself playing magic. It is, it, it, can, it can be really funny. Anyway, putting some uh, nice, beautiful tokens uh, on here, or counters, I should say, trike arms on the Triskelions. I got these from the Rhineland Adventures, so shout out to the Rhineland Adventures in Germany. They make the coolest counters, they got a lot of cool stuff. And uh, Martin is a great guy. I mean, look at this board state. This should be a winning board state. All I have to do is use my coffin. Use the coffin. Use the coffin. Oh my god. Really? Look at me sorting out my battlefield. And missing everything that's important here. So with Thomas's coffin, you can pay three. You know. And put a creature in the coffin, then, then the creature is exiled from the game until you untap the coffin again. And you can choose not to untap it during your untap step. And when you untap it, the creature comes back into play tapped. But I already passed a turn it seems, so I think I missed this completely. I mean, I'm feeling very good about myself because I've got a lovely board state, but yeah, I should be winning, obviously. A 
this must be interesting for Ana as well. It's like, okay, he's not putting, he's not killing the the Hazazon with the uh, rocket launcher. He's not putting it in the box with tons of coffin. I think I still got a chance. And that's what he's probably been thinking the last six, seven turns. There's a disenchant. So he's going to disenchant the rocket launcher here. Very happy to find it because that, that would have definitely been uh, the end of the road for Anna. Although, you know, he's on 14, so I would have to get 28 mana to kill him. Well, I also got the tri counters, of course. So probably I would be able to kill him. So talking about the trike counters, by the way, I can just kill Hazazon with the trike counters. There are so many ways I can... Ah, uh, it's just ridiculous. Let's see if Ana is going to pass the turn. It looks like I'm going to use... Oh, I want to do my Tonus' coffin trick here. Oh man, I've got, I've got like super tunnel vision here. So what I want to do, and this is pretty cool synergy, right? You can put the trike in the coffin then in my next turn I can untap the coffin and the trike comes back into play tap but you've got the ETB triggers again so it comes into play with three additional counters so it's in a 7-7 which is pretty cool but I can also put hazards on in the coffin and all the sand warrior tokens disappear and I can trample all over him and win the game but I guess I'm not seeing that anyway taking my turn now I'm gonna untap So it's gonna come back into play tapped with six counters. Well, congratulations. It is pretty cool to see the deck doing its thing. You know, it's really working full on. It's almost working too good because I'm getting so distracted by all my options. I don't see the obvious plays. Six cards in hand, by the way. So I'm probably gonna draw to card number seven. Looks like I'm first gonna find out how much mana I actually have. I tap all the Tron lands, I got nine mana. If I tap the workshop, I got three. And then I need to draw a card with the Gemini Tome to get to seven if I want to, if I want to activate my Loa twice. Exactly, so I'm gonna go up to seven, then I'm gonna use the Loa, I'm gonna go up to eight, then I'm gonna untap the Loa again and all the Tron lands using the Candelabra of Taunus. Here you see me counting. There we go. Three mana floating still. I'm gonna play out something. I'm gonna play out another candlestick. Wow. I'm gonna draw another card. So now I can do this trick again. I can generate even more mana. I've got two candlesticks now. That's kind of insane. Tap everything again, so it's going to generate nine mana. Six mana from the workshop, by the way. I mean, it is really nice to see Candelabra and Tron going off like this. That's pretty cool. Got 11 mana in total, so going to use the Candelabra again. Going to have five mana floating. And I can draw another card with Library of Alexandria. That means that I get to draw three cards off of one Loa in one turn. That's insane. That's like an Ancestral Recall. And now it looks like I'm going to use the Coffin. And it looks like Anna is going to eat one of the Sand Warrior tokens and bounce back the Karaka. So finally... The quarter dropped, right? I saw what I had to do and I put the houses on in the coffin. And then I can attack him for eight. Actually for more, I can attack him for 12, put him on three, and then I can kill him with the counters. And I win the game. And then we see the, uh, the long distance handshake by Anna. And Anna, thank you so much. You've been a great sport and it's been awesome to see your deck in action. I think my deck was a little bit too... Uh, too much, right? I've got just so much aggression in my deck and you need a little bit more time, but I do love that idea of Karakas and Hazazan and Stang and the Diamond Valley. I think it's super cool. Um, I was also very happy with how my deck performed, obviously. You could see exactly what my deck wants to do and how strong it can be. And yes, I know it's all artifact and after sideboarding, um, you know, probably gonna see Shatterstorm, Energy Fluxes, you name it. Uh, and that's gonna be a problem, I know. But I wanna see 
how good and how far can I take it with an all out artifact deck? Just for fun, it's just cool, you know, it's, it's cool to make. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed my deck. I'm sorry for kind of missing that obvious Hazazon uh, target there in game number two, but I hope you still enjoyed it. Uh, at least I did, it was really cool to see my deck doing exactly what it wants to do and it was also really sweet to see the Caracas Legends in action from Anna. So thank you Anna again for uh, for joining me to make this episode. You always come up with awesome decks and I would also like to thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And that was the episode for today and oh boy what an interesting match it was. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I did playing it and actually commenting on it now afterwards. There was just so much happening. I remember looking at my battlefield go like how do I do this? What's my most optimal uh, you know, way of playing this out? And uh, yeah, it's been very, very interesting to look back at it as well. It's just such a fun deck to play. And also Anna's deck was very cool to see in action. So I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you very much for watching. And before you go, I'd like to ask you to like, share, or and comment on this video. All these things are completely free and they really help the channel move forward. And of course, if you're not a subscriber yet, please consider subscribing to the channel. It would mean a lot to me. And uh, talking about supporting the show, you can also become a patron of the show. How does this work? Uh, uh, please visit Patreon dot com slash timmy talks for all the information because there you can find out how you can become a sponsor of the show and help me to continue create this content for you it already starts with just one dollar a month so if you could spare a dollar a month please take a moment to check out patreon.com slash timmy talks for more info and the cool thing is if you become a uh patron of the show your name will be mentioned at the end of every single video in the end scroll including this one so let's go to the end scroll Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee!